Recent decades have seen so-called blockbuster medications such as Prozac, which was approved by the FDA in 1987. Recent studies have shown that around 13% of Americans and 9% of Canadians had taken Prozac-type selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI, antidepressants in the last month. Studies have also shown that antidepressant use is highly gendered, racialized, and classed, with women being more than twice as likely to take antidepressants than men. Women over 60 are the highest demographic for antidepressant use. Aside from gender and age, however, antidepressant use does not exactly track along lines of oppression, and college-educated and white people are far more likely to take SSRIs than racialized people and people with high school education or less. University students, in particular, are likely to be diagnosed with anxiety and depression and to be prescribed SSRIs. Why do you think that is? Does it show that universities cause mental distress? Or does it reflect something about the demographic of university students, such as students often being a privileged demographic with relatively easy access to medical care. Prozac-type medications are not necessarily more effective than earlier antidepressants, but they have far fewer and less serious side effects than the types of antidepressants that were used up until the mid-80s. Prior to Prozac, the side effects of antidepressants were so severe that they would only be prescribed in the most extreme cases of depression. The invention and marketing of Prozac-type drugs has meant that far more people are treated for mental health issues by doctors than psychiatrists and as outpatients rather than inpatients. This means that today, far fewer people who are treated for mental health conditions experience psychiatry, let alone involuntary institutionalization in a psychiatric asylum compared to the 1970s and before. Despite their role in the closure of asylums, blockbuster pharmaceuticals such as Prozac have propelled contemporary psychiatry in the completely opposite direction of what mad activists had called for. In the last 30 years, we have seen a so-called scientific revolution in psychiatry, such that psychiatry now primarily values quantitative, positivistic protocols for research, emphasizes quote-unquote objective data, prefers neuroscientific and genetic explanations over cultural and humanistic approaches, and is increasingly funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Indeed, psychiatry can now be described as biopsychiatry, as it relies almost exclusively on biomedical styles of diagnosis and pharmacological treatments rather than therapy, peer support, or political activism. Psychiatrists today often do little more than dispense prescriptions and follow up on how patients are tolerating medications. Psychiatric appointments are often short, a check-in on medications, and a renewal or change of prescriptions. Patients who want to talk about their mental health beyond their response to medications will often be referred to psychologists or psychotherapists rather than being allowed to take up a psychiatrist's time. In 2003, members of a Mad Pride movement began a hunger strike to demand human rights and mental health. But unlike their counterparts in the 1970s, they were not protesting institutionalization so much as they were protesting the domination of biological approaches to psychiatry and the ever-increasing and widespread use of prescription drugs to treat mental and emotional crises, crises that at least some Mad Pride activists deem to have social and political rather than biological causes. Mad Pride activists demanded that the American Psychiatric Association provide evidence that clearly establishes the validity of schizophrenia, depression, or other major mental illnesses as biologically based diseases, or evidence that mental and emotional distress results from chemical imbalances in the brain and that psychopharmaceuticals correct these imbalances. In response, the APA was initially silent and finally acknowledged that it could not provide this data. Today, compared to the 1970s, MAD activism is less all or nothing. 
that is, one need not be entirely for psychiatry or against it. Today, there are also coalitional possibilities between consumers and critical psychiatrists, and in some sense, the enemy for some mad pride activists may now be the pharmaceutical industry rather than healthcare practitioners. The lectures for this module have only discussed the tip of the iceberg of anti-psychiatry writings and movements. A huge body of literature exists challenging psychiatry, both in the forms that were common in the 19th and early 20th centuries, such as involuntary institutionalization, shock therapy and lobotomies, and in the dominant form today, pharmaceuticals, an anti-psychiatry political movement has existed for decades with people referring to themselves as psychiatric survivors and speaking of psychiatric oppression. Although, as we have seen, critical disability studies and disability activism have challenged medicalization in a more general way, nothing similar to the situation of psychiatry can be said about other branches or subspecialties of medicine, such as cardiology or dentistry, what should we make of this? Why has psychiatry been found to be so much more oppressive than other branches of medicine? Does it suggest that mental illness is not really equivalent to physical illnesses? What are the advantages and disadvantages of thinking of it as such? Historically, a wide range of unconventional, transgressive, or rebellious attitudes, behaviors, and lifestyles were pathologized as signs of insanity. This included slaves who wanted to be free, women who didn't want to be married, people who loved or desired members of their own sex, people who did not conform to gender norms, feminists, anti-vivisectionists, and vegetarians. Were these simply a string of mistakes in what remains a legitimate science of psychiatry? Or does this history suggest that psychiatry persistently reflects the accepted norms of the time and pathologizes abnormal behaviors and beliefs? What does this history suggest about the epistemology of madness? In The Mad Woman in the Academy, Phoebe Wolframe draws on the figure of the mad woman in the attic embodied by Rochester's wife, Bertha Mason, in Charlotte Bronte's 1847 book, Jane Eyre. In the novel, Rochester, the master of the mansion, allows everyone to believe that Bertha has disappeared, abandoning her husband and daughter. In actual fact, however, he is keeping her captive in the attic while he proceeds to court a new wife. Perhaps surprisingly, Rochester is the victim in this story, as Bronte tells it, for Bertha Mason is described as congenitally mad. It is thus supposed to be understandable that Rochester would lock her away to try to move on with his life. In the end of the book, Bertha sets fire to the mansion, destroying it and dying by jumping from the roof. Rochester is blinded and loses a hand in the fire, but he and Jane are now able to marry. In Jean Reese's 1966 prequel and feminist post-colonial response to Jane Eyre, Wide Sargasso Sea, attention is drawn to the fact that Bertha Mason is a racialized woman in Bronte's novel, being Creole Jamaican. In Reese's retelling, Bertha is made mad by her unhappy patriarchal marriage, displacement, assimilation into European society, and confinement. From Reese onwards, feminists have questioned whether the mad woman in the attic is not, in fact, a figure of oppression. Changing the attic for the academy, this is what Wolfram argues with respect to the mad. She describes her own experiences of medicalization that dated to childhood and argues that madness should be studied in universities less through the lens of medicine and more in tandem with identity categories such as race, gender, sexuality, and class. Sanism, Wolfram posits, should be spoken of alongside, quote, racism, heterosexism, cissexism, ageism, classism, and other isms, close quote. And just as we speak of white privilege, class privilege, and male privilege, so we ought to talk about sane privilege, such as the privilege of not being treated as dangerous or violent, the privilege of seeing positive cultural representations of oneself, the privilege of not being advised to underachieve, and the privilege of not having 
once every decision, choice, belief, or feeling interpreted as a symptom. As Wolfram argues, discussing sanism and sane privilege is particularly pertinent to the academy or the university since cognitive ableism and sanism are particularly embedded in this institution that so prizes reason. But the so-called man of reason that the academy prizes has long been figured as a white male and women, especially women of color such as Bertha Mason, have been those most likely to be pathologized as mad. And so Wolfram argues that the academy is a particularly acute site of sanism and that sanism is deeply implicated in other isms such as racism, sexism, and heterosexism.